Every year, around the Christmas holiday, magical things always seem to happen. Some things are marvellous and joyful, like visits from Santa or a snowman coming alive. Many people say they can feel the Christmas magic in the air or around them. Some things aren't so joyful. Around Christmas every year, kidnappings, murder and suicide rates go up drastically as well. Even when hard things like this happen, People often feel, yet rarely do they admit, that they still feel a kind of holiday magic behind it, although be it a dark magic. One example comes from a Christmas demon known as Grampus. The Grampus is well known in countries like Germany and Switzerland, protecting naughty children in the dead of Christmas Eve night. Here is one such account. December 6th, 2013 my name is Ellie Rockford. I am currently seven years old as I write this. I confide in this journal something I can't tell my family because they would never believe me. I am often told that I am very smart for my age because I say and do things that most kids my age don't. But if I tell a strange story, no matter how hard I get them to believe me, my parents and siblings say it's just my imagination. Today, I looked out my window into the street behind our house and saw a man who looked like a shadow with horns. His eyes glowed orange and seeing him scared me a lot. He was ringing a bunch of bells for something but I just tried to ignore him and sleep. Then I heard a knock on the door. I went down to see who it was for mummy and daddy but when I got to the door someone stuck a car through our meal slot and ran off really quickly. The card had a picture of a monster who had bow legs, a tail, and horns on a scary looking goat head that looked half human. I was so scared that it was the thing in the street, but I don't know what to do. I think I know what it is, but I hope I'm wrong. I showed the card to my dad and he said it was Grampus. The bottom of the card said, Gross von Grampus. Daddy says every year Grampus punishes bad boys and girls on Christmas, but Santa gives good boys and girls toys. So now, I'm not so scared. I always get toys on Christmas, so I must be a good kid. I still didn't tell him about the thing on the street. December 24th, 2013 My parents will be gone for most of tonight and Christmas morning tomorrow for some stupid work thing they both have. We usually have a Christmas at 6am, but we have to wait for mummy and daddy to get home first. Mom told Brad, my oldest brother, that we would have a babysitter because she didn't trust him to watch all five of us by himself. Mom often let Brad watch us, but we had broke a lot of things the last couple of times we were left alone, so Mummy said she would get Rebecca to watch us. Rebecca came to the house around five. She was very pretty and Brad couldn't stop staring at her. Mummy and Daddy left a couple minutes after Rebecca got here. This was the first time Rebecca had watched six kids at the same time before and I don't think she knew what she was getting herself into. My youngest sister, Molly, who's three, threw a tantrum after our parents left. Levi and Garrett, my younger twin brothers, who are both five, started fighting. Brad talked with Rebecca most of the night and Rachel spent most of her night in her room. Mom and Dad said that we would still get Christmas gifts tomorrow but we had to wait to open them until they got home. We made hot cocoa, but the cocoa makers broke so the hot chocolate burned our mouths and we all got candy canes too. Rebecca started to put us to bed at 8 and finally succeeded at 9.30. Even though she was clearly exhausted and frustrated with us, she told us she had fun and that she wouldn't have spent Christmas Eve any other way. I woke in the middle of the night at about 11 to see a crimson moon casting a dim, red glow on the winter snow. I looked out my bedroom window and saw a red object coming towards our house, fast. It was hard to make out, but it looked like a red sleigh being pulled by reindeer. I instantly recognised this as Santa's sleigh and ran to hide on the stairs and waited for him to come down the chimney anxiously. Out of the window to the right of our fireplace, I saw the sleigh fly overhead and heard many hooves trotting on the roof. I made sure to remain perfectly still and silent as a mouse. 
I waited for what felt like an eternity while soft footsteps echoed on the roof above me, getting closer to the chimney. I heard scuffling as ash and dust started falling from the fireplace. Soon, two black boots landed. Then the rest of jolly old St. Nick came through the fireplace with a bag of toys on his back. Without speaking a word, he went straight to our tree. He took gifts from his bag and scattered them under our lit up plastic evergreen, then started on the milk and cookies we left for him. I felt that I had held my breath the entire time I was hiding on the stairs. I couldn't believe I was spying on the real Santa Claus in my own home. Eventually, he made his way over to her stockings and started putting various knickknacks and candies in her stockings, starting with Molly. When he got to Levi, he took out a small black rock and eyed it sadly before placing it in Levi's stocking. It took me a second to realise that he gave Levi coal. I tried to stifle a laugh to the best of my abilities, but a small squeak escaped my lips anyways. Santa turned around and scanned the room. I remained as still as ever. He turned back to the stockings, this time keeping his back to me, and put a piece of coal in Garrett's stocking too. He put a candy cane in Brad's stocking, along with a pocket knife. Rachel got a new phone and some Kit Kats. Finally, he moved to my stocking, which is always furthest to the right. Even though I'm the middle child, he began rummaging through a sack as I leaned forward excitedly to see what presents I was getting. Santa put out a large jet black piece of coal and stuffed it into my stocking. I felt a wave of anger, sadness and regret all at once. I almost stood upright then to tell off the old jolly elf, but when he turned around I saw tears in his eyes. He looked as if he was filled with similar emotions as I was, like he didn't like to have to give bad kids coal. It was for this reason that I remained quiet as Santa climbed back up my chimney, got into his sleigh and flew away. I watched out my downstairs window as the sleigh flew from the roof and into the black abyss of Christmas night. I sat there, still in place for a very long time, pondering how I could be a better child next year when I spotted something out of the window again. I looked like the same figure I'd seen before, but this time, the sleigh looked as if it was black. I wrote this off as it was really dark outside, except for the moon's red glow. I wondered why Santa would come back. Maybe he forgot something. Maybe he'd made a mistake. Maybe. I wasn't naughty, and he was on his way back right now to fix his mistake. My mind was racing from one thought to another as I began to hype myself up for all my possible Christmas presents. I'd stopped watching the window and had begun to daydream about the next morning, until hooves on the roof interrupted my thoughts. I heard loud, heavy clacking this time as he got closer to the chimney. Ash began to fall down the chimney, creating an ashy cloud around the fireplace as what I assumed to be Santa began climbing down and landed a loud crash. My final thought before seeing what came next was, why has no one noticed all of this? Through the cloud of thick black ash protruded two large horns with stripes of red and white like those of a candy cane's. As the dust settled, the rest of the figure was revealed. His skin was a pale icy looking blue. His beard was like Santa's, except it was black and came to a point. His nose was long and his face looked grizzled, but more human than I thought. His horns looked like they had touched the ceiling if he jumped. His body looked human in shape, but animal in appearance. His legs were twisted and ended in hooves, like that of a cow or a bull. He had a long tail. His torso was contorted and everything but his face and palms were covered in fur. He had broken chains around his wrists and what looked like a heavy, red Christmas ornament attached to his tail by another chain. His ears were pointed and so were his yellow teeth. Despite his horrid, outlandish appearance, the most noticeable things about the creature were its bells that it wore and the basket on his back that had the limp arm of a child hanging from it. The stories were true and so was Krampus. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had seen sleighs go by, magic reindeer fly overhead, and I had even seen Santa Claus himself. But none of that could have prepared me for the beast that is Krampus. He moved around the room with such speed that I was caught off guard. This thing looked about eight feet tall without its horns, 
and with them he tarred over everything in our large home. He made his way to the fireplace and took the coal from Levi's stocking. He rolled it along in his long, bony fingers for a moment, then took the coal from Garrett's stocking, and then, finally mine. He studied the coal for a moment, a wide smile, full of pointy, yellow teeth, beamed across his face. Naughty little children, I heard it say in a cold, raspy voice. A shiver ran up my spine as he spoke. I was paralysed in both fear and awe at the creature that roamed my living room beneath me. I thought he was moving towards the tree, but it walked past it and started going down the hallway into, into Levi and Garrett's room. I remembered the things my father used to say about it, that he whips bad kids, takes them away. Sometimes he eats them, sometimes he shakes them and scares them into being good. All these hard thoughts and more danced through my head as the monster creeped into the twins' room. I tried to scream with all my might, but no sign would escape my mouth. I said Fanny was able to choke out. Levi! Garrett! Screams had already filled their room. Levi came running out of his room, screaming his head off as Garrett followed suit. The creature's long twisted arm reached out from the room and grabbed Garrett's leg, pulling him back into the room. I stood up from my spot on the stairs and motioned for Levi to come to me. Garrett's screams fell silent. The Grampus emerged from the room alone. His nose seemed shorter now, his face even more deformed now. I gripped Levi's hand tightly and we ran for Brad's room. I wheeled on the door again and again, but he wouldn't come out. I would have tried harder to get his attention, but I could hear it coming up the stairs as each hoof hit each step. I took Levi to the laundry room and told him to hide in the laundry chute. Once he was inside, I began lowering the laundry hamper so he could get downstairs without confronting the monster. Before he was lowered out of sight, I told Levi to start the hot cocoa maker because I had a plan. He nodded and once he got to the bottom, I felt the hamper get lighter as he climbed out. I heard the hoof footsteps getting lighter and closer to the laundry room. I began pulling the laundry hamper up and climbed in just as the door was violently flung open, despite the locks on it. The beast licked his lips with his long, skinny tongue as he slowly approached my trembling body inside the hamper. The hamper wouldn't fall no matter how hard I rocked it, and the creature was nearly upon me. I felt its breath on me as it excitedly panted, getting further. I expected its breath to be hot like that of a dog's, but instead it felt like the coldest winter chill caressing my skin. I shook the whole hamper as savagely as I could before it finally budged. The hamper fell, and before I knew it, I was on the first floor. I crawled out of the chute and ran to the kitchen as the demon rampaged upstairs. As I came into the kitchen, I noticed no signs of my little brother, but I did see that the hot cocoa maker was on. The stomping of the creature upstairs continued, but didn't seem to be near the stairs, so I focused on finding Levi. He wasn't hiding in any cabinets, and he wasn't anywhere in the living room. I decided that he might be in his room, so I quietly creeped to it slowly but steadily. The twins' room was trashed entirely, and Levi wasn't there. There was blood on the wall. I shuddered to think that it once belonged to my baby brother. A small, bloody handprint was smeared on the wall by the door. Dread was all that I could feel at that moment. Dread for misbehaving all year. Dread for what had become my little brother. And dread for the silence that fell in place of the hooves stomping around upstairs. I quickly and silently made my way back to the kitchen and took out a large coffee pitcher of scolding hot cocoa. As I kept out of the kitchen into the living room, I had an ominous feeling of dread as if I were being watched. I could barely see in the dark of night and I couldn't locate our light switches. The only sort of light I had was the dim eerie glow of the lights from the Christmas tree. As I scanned all entrances to the dining room, something moving caught my eye. The chandelier had begun to start swinging as if something had bumped it or hit it. There was soft thudding that accompanied the squeaking of the rocking corona. As I looked around to make out another vague shape in the glow of Christmas lights, I saw what bumped the chandelier. The monster was crawling on my ceiling, 
like a large, twisted spider. His arms were bent in excruciating looking ways to grip the ceiling and watch me with his eyes that burned like fire. I wanted to scream at the top of my lungs at the very sight of it, but instead I held my ground. A cruel smile spread across the face of the predator who was stalking me. He undug his fingers from the ceiling and landed on the floor in front of me with a thunderous crash. Mere inches away from me, this was his mistake. I threw the entire pitcher of burning hot cocoa on his face and the beast immediately started writhing in agony. He covered his hands over his quickly blistering face. He took his hands off his face just as it began to melt and peel off. The bits of flesh and blood melting away to reveal his horrible skull with its eyes still in their sockets. It froze for a while and for a brief moment I was happily assured and content that the grampus was dead. But then it only started cackling an awful and disturbingly maleficent laugh. It pierced my ears like knives and overloomed me to instill as much fear as it could. It was working. Before my very eyes, the muscles around the creature's skull started to grow back and in seconds, its new face had formed. It looked more like a goat with pointy teeth than a human, but you could still partially see it in there. Its beard was still as long as before but now I looked almost out of place on the demonic beast's head. I turned and ran behind the Christmas tree, avoiding the abomination's lanky arms as I ran by. The grampus immediately started coming towards the tree intent on harming me. I pushed the large plastic evergreen on the monster and ran back upstairs to find my little brother. I wheeled on the other sibling's door, but no one would wake up no matter how hard I pounded on their doors. Everyone locks the doors to their rooms when we go to sleep, so we're not bothered, but the doors were also heavy and not much sound got through them. I began to shout for Levi as loud as I could, hoping he'd respond. Then Levi appeared at the top of the stairs. We stared at each other. He looked terrified and sad. I started to walk towards him when suddenly my baby brother was impaled by the grampus horns. His body was thrusted up and thrashed round by the savage creature as it convulsed and shook spastically on its horns. I've seen people die on TV before, but watching it in real life is entirely different. No one should have to go through it. My brother didn't deserve that. No one deserves that. Santa and Christmas are about love and cheer. Grampus made Christmas about hatred and retribution. I watched helplessly while the thing ripped my brother's shaking body from its horns and dropped its lifeless body into the basket on his back. The demon began to strut towards me with molestous intentions, so I ducked into mum and dad's empty room and opened the top right drawer in my dad's dresser. I wasn't tall enough to see what I was reaching for, but when I felt it, I pulled out my dad's pistol. I opened the other dresser and had put two bullets in the pistol by the time the creature burst open the door. I shot it twice and hit it both times, but it was unfazed by the bullets. The loud noise clearly hurt both our ears and as the monster clawed at its ears while screaming in pain, I began to quickly crawl towards the window until something long, thin, tight and slimy gripped my leg and began pulling me back. I looked behind me in my terror to see the grampus was using its incredibly long tongue to pull me into its mouth, full of sharp, jagged teeth. I began to breathe in and out quicker and quicker and began panicking as my foot got closer to its mouth. I lifted my left leg and kicked it in the face twice before its tongue finally loosened. Before I could breathe, Grampus picked me up and began shaking me wildly. I kicked him a second time, this time with my right foot, and he flung me into the hallway where I began limping away. I'd reached the end of the hallway when I heard a loud puffing crack sound, moments before feeling a sharp sting all across my back. I looked back and saw that the holiday devil had whipped me with a whip like a lion tamer would use. I felt the warm ooze onto my back as new pain started setting in. I started to limp away to safety when I was picked up by Grampus again. His long, cold fingers wrapped around my back and stung my cut even worse. He looked at me, right in the eye, before lifting me behind him and dropping me into the perch basket on his back. On the outside of the basket, it looks like it could only fit a couple of kids inside, but the inside was massive. I fell into a mountain of bodies, 
There were hundreds or thousands of kids in that one basket, piled on each other, not all alive. Where you couldn't see other kids, which made up the trembling ground, you saw only darkness. No sounds could be heard from inside or outside really, either. Kids would scream, mutter, shout until their throats clearly hurt, but no sounds came from their mouths. Every time I thought the situation couldn't get any worse, it got way worse. I waited what felt like millennia to escape, as new kids would fall in and join the confusion to show how much time passed. Eventually, the Krampus reached into the basket and began to pull out another child. His arm became larger as he reached in the basket and stretched out to a panicked girl. I grabbed onto her leg and let myself be carried to salvation. When we were pulled from the basket, I let go of the kid and fell behind Krampus. He didn't notice I escaped. He was too focused on the girl. He looked at the small girl for a second, for biting into her flesh with his large, sharp teeth. I never knew the kid's name before the creature devoured her, but I owe my life to her for helping me escape. I backed away slowly from behind as Grandpa's feasted on my fellow child at its dinner table. I had no idea where I was now, but it was dark and it was cold. I think it's where the creature lives. After the monster was finished eating, he picked up a small wooden box, opened the top and spat something that glowed a bright green into it. He then took the box over to a rusted doofus that he opened, entered, then left a few minutes later without the box. He then left the room, leaving the child's remains on a large platter and a rusty door to my curiosity. I opened the door to see dozens of more wooden boxes. I also saw many creepy looking porcelain dolls and other creepy toys. The door behind me closed and I was immersed in total darkness. I got out my phone and used it to barely light my way. I walked past a jack-in-the-box with a scary face. I walked past a baby doll that looked withered and old. I found a sack doll that looked like a creepy rotting skeleton too. I thought it was like Santa's rejected toy shop until I found the words, misfits, smeared in red paint next to a clown with a skull for a head, blue eyes in its sockets and big fleshy hands. I was terrified someone else was caught in that room before. When I got closer to the clown, it jumped towards me and yelled, Wanna play? I got really scared and jumped back as the clown let out a scary laugh. I heard scurrying and tiny footsteps of other toys from all around. I started catching the dolls and gingerbread men turning their heads as I ran along the walls, trying to relocate the door. I found another message on the wall. Why can't we die? Was scratched into the wall by something. I wanted nothing more than for this night to end. When I located the door, I bolted for it as soon as I saw it, but was tripped by a toy soldier with realistic burns on half his face. I kicked the tiny hunk of plastic away and moved closer to the door when a deformed baby doll bit appeared from the darkness and sank her teeth into my leg. I felt a surge of pain and fell to the ground. I furiously punched the doll's head repeatedly until it unlocked its tiny teeth from my flesh. The porcelain atrocity scurried off as another terrible toy danced around me in the darkness. More and more of them kept popping up and coming out of, out of the boxes, like the one Grampus spat the glowing thing into. The toys began muttering words, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. The muttering got lighter and lighter until I understood some of their words. Feel our pain. He killed us, but not entirely. He gobbled me up and spat my soul into a puppet. Kill us. Let us die. The things they said were terrible, dreadful to say the least. I got up and started to make my way to the door as the dolls chanted more obscene things to me. We're gonna eat you alive, like he at us. I'm gonna rip out your eyes. Although they continued to chant, None of them came towards me as I moved around the dark room. I saw a small toy skeleton in Santa's clothes with a beard move by. A puppet, with many nails sticking out of its wooden head, was strung up to the ceiling, moving and wrestling with its strings. I spotted a stool that was pulled to a workbench with tools and a teddy bear on it. The teddy bear had real bear claws sticking from his paws and real human teeth in its mouth. I reasoned that this was Grampus' demented toy shop and decided to leave it before it was too late. I walked past the bench to the door 
and started pulling on the rusty metal handle. The door was extremely heavy, but slowly budged and started opening as I pulled back with all my might. Light began to be at the room and the misfit toys dashed to the shadows to avoid the light. I ran from the dark room, closed the door behind me and leaned on it for a while to catch my bearings. I looked around at the only other room in this place that was familiar to me. I went by the long table the monster ate the nameless girl at, trying not to think about it. Trying to think of something, anything to distract me from the horrors I had bared witness to on the most unsuspecting and happiest time of year. I walked to an open door and poked only half my head out to scan the perimeter of the room. It led to a large room that had various whips, saws and various other torture devices. I kept in and kept to the wall. I spotted three dark wooden doors amongst the darkness and concrete walls. I also found a window and the snow outside was falling so slowly, so peacefully. Two doors were on one large wall, opposite of the window and the other was on the wall to the right of the window. I first tried on one of the doors on the long wall, but had decided beforehand to go to the door right of the window, thinking it would lead me closer to a door out or something. The walls were lined with racks, and racks were lined with hellish masks. Some had horns, some had long serpent tongues sticking out, some had teeth, some had patches of skin, some had antlers, one was a weird skull with antlers, and the antlers had lit candles on them. It was so strange. The room was so large. The other door led to the same room. I left without moving the door in fear that closing the heavy door would create noise and would lead the creature to me. I walked alongside the wall to avoid the equipment, straight to the only door I had left. I opened the door slowly and with caution. The first thing in the room I noticed was this strange tree that looked like an upside down purple Christmas tree. The trunk in was on the bottom, but the pines and branches looked upside down. The tree was decorated with red and green lights, and small bones. There was another window in this room, but it was on the same side as the last. There was an open doorway that led to a hallway that teed off, and two signs labelled the directions. The right one said, surveillance room, and the left one said, stables. I went to the stables thinking I might be able to find a reindeer to fly out of this place with. It seemed like a silly plan now in hindsight. I opened the stable door and awful smells invaded my nostrils immediately. There was frost on the floor as well. There were eight stables lined up along the wall to the right, each with demonic reindeer heads sticking out. Below each head was the doors to each stall, each with pendants of names on them. I read the names out loud as I started down the row. Each stair was grotesque in their own right. One or two had exposed skulls, each had jagged teeth, some had manes and others had dried blood on their fur. Seven of their eyes glowed red. Slasher, I said as I passed the first one. Rightful, Gorgon, Putrid, Cyclops. Cyclops was missing one fiery eye. Rabies, Goner. The last monstrous reindeer looked like a hellish Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. His head held flames that danced from his gnarled snout to the back of its mane. Between its sharpened bloody antlers, furiously flickered bolts of electricity. Blitzerg. I decided running one was out of the question and began searching for an exit. I realised the only door to the room was the one I came from. I looked all over the room, looking for some other way out and saw the reason for the cold. The top crease in the upper part of the wall was missing and led outside. It was far too high to reach. I left the stable room and went into the surveillance room. The handle felt icy cold as I slowly opened the door. The room, like all the rest, was large. One wall was covered with monitors. The bottom middle monitor stuck out more than the rest and had a keyboard below it. A chair was also pulled up to it. Each screen had various kids on it, some in dreadful conditions, others minding their own business. No sign came from the monitors, but I started to notice I was hearing a ticking noise. A clock above the door, I came in red. 5.45am, Christmas Day. Didn't start at my house until 6 o'clock. The wall opposite of the monitors had many names scratched onto it. 
I wondered if the dead girl's name was scratched into the wall. A door that read, Exit, was to the right of the monitors, but the computer said, Search name. I sat in the large chair and typed in Guard Rockford. A nutcracker that had two bodies attached from the side of his head popped up. Each body seemed to be trying to yank away from the other. Its face looked like it was in pain, and it had the same colour of eyes as Levi and Garrett. I looked up Levi Rockford, and the same thing popped up. I sat frozen in awe for a moment. Tears filled my eyes and ran down my cheeks. The ticking of the clock seemed to turn into clopping as I sobbed. I was crying more than I ever cried before. I cried so hard I began hearing a ringing. Then the chair I was in spun round and I was face to face with Brampus. He looked menacing and insidiously sinister. His horns were partly covered in blood. His long fingers looked sharp and his eyes burnt like never before. He waved his long, sharp bony finger at me and tisked. Naughty, naughty. He said cruelly and mockingly. He licked my face with his incredibly long tongue, then began to wrap it around my throat. He started constricting his tongue and choked me. I was gargling and coughing and struggling did close to nothing. I started feeling weaker and weaker as my head heated up my lungs, screamed for air. My vision even started to become blurred. Then I knew if I didn't do something quickly, I was going to die. I punched him in the face with all my might and knocked him back for only a brief moment as his tongue recoiled into his mouth. I utilised my time and ran towards the exit. I felt the ground shake directly behind me as heavy hoofs shook the floor violently in their wake. I felt the creature's cold breath on the back of my neck. I pushed the door open and ran into the freezing cold as my pursuer followed suit. I ran until I was knee deep in snow, until a lanky hand grabbed me and started dragging me back. The dark sky slowly lit as the sun started to emerge from the bottom horizon. The grandpa stopped dragging me. He dropped me and stared briefly at the rising sun. I'll come get you again, he said, as he dropped my leg and retreated to his lair as I lay in the snow. A silhouetted figure came from the distance. I closed my eyes for what felt like seconds, but when I opened my eyes the sun was higher in the sky and the figure was closer. I could make out that he was wearing red, then I passed out again. I opened my eyes to see an outstretched hand with a black mitten on it. It belonged to a fat, bearded man with a silly hat. Santa? I inquired. Shh, child, he said in a soft, soothing voice. Let's take you home. The next thing I remember is waking up in my bed at home. Levi and Garrett were kidnapped in the middle of the night. I found out from Rebecca, Brad and Molly, who already told our parents and the cops. I tried to tell them what really happened, but no one believed me. They only got mad when I tried to explain it to him, so I gave up on trying to tell them. That's how I spent my Christmas. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment below. All feedback, good or otherwise is always appreciated. If you have any creepy stories of your own or have any topics that you would like me to cover, feel free to send them in via any of my social media. You can find all links to my social media in the description below. Until next time guys, make sure you lock your doors, stay safe and I'll see you next video.